Shabash. Shabash in Hindustani means congratulations and thank you. All right. I'm 100 years old, you know. And people ask me, how does it feel to be 100 years old? Well, it feels like being 100 years old. <laughs> and you know what, folks? It's great. I feel like I've been so blessed to live these years. Not that they've been not, you know, there are the hills and the valleys. <laughs> In fact, I'm very grateful to be 100 years old. <laughs> You, you know, it, it happens. <laughs> it happens. So I'm so pleased to be here with you folks. This, I, I'm honored to be here. But you know, in 1914, right in the middle of World War I, my parents, who were, who were osteopathic physicians, left New York with a four-month-old baby <laughs> to go to India. And there were U-boats in the water, and there were it was blackouts all the way through. Got across the Atlantic, went to India. Went across land to northern India and started their practice in the villages of North India. Now, this was not an easy tra task because they had their work was done in the jungles of North India. And for me, that was just wonderful, but it was very hard. They took their medical work back in and moved from one place to the next throughout the time. In 1918, the pandemic struck. The pan fluid, you know something about that? <laughs> and I asked my mother how they got through it. And her one response was, we were very, very careful, and we lived through it. So then in 1920, she went into labor with me at the Taj Mahal. She's kind of a drama queen. <laughs> <laughs> I loved my early childhood. I thought it was the best thing in the world, in and out of the jungles and so on. But in 19... 26, I started school, and my life changed, because all of a sudden, I was a dummy of the class. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to read. I couldn't read. I knew the alphabet. I knew ABCs. I knew one, two, three, and all of that stuff, but I couldn't put it together. We didn't know about dyslexia at that time. So I had to repeat first grade, but I got through it, and I don't know how I learned. In 1978 or something like that, I was with a group of, of holistic physicians sitting around a table and we were talking. There were 10 of us, and six of us were severely dyslexic. And we looked at each other and we said, well, maybe that's why we had to find an alternative way of looking at medicine. <laughs> because we don't know how we learned. We don't know what, <laughs> how this thing came together, but we did, and we got through school through uh, medical school. I started at Women's Medical College in 1941 in September. And when we started, there were 50 members of our class and only 25 of us graduated because we were told that we had to be stronger and tougher and brighter than the men. And so anything that we did got us out of there. So I made it through there. And the interesting thing, too, was that in December 7th of 1941, World War II started. And all of my medical education was during the war. And what we learned about was that the medicine that we were learning was a killing machine. We learned how to kill bacteria. We learned how to uh, get rid of, we thought we tried to get rid of pain. Everything that we did <clears throat> was focused on getting rid of and killing stuff. But we had amazing tools during this wartime. We learned about energy. 
we learned that the mind had something to do with, with the work that we were doing. And we were just beginning to learn about the mind, but we didn't learn anything about the spirit. But we got through medical school. I got through medical school. And in December of 46, I started my internship at the Deaconess Hospital in Cincinnati. But they'd never had a woman in, uh, in the intern there, so they had no place for me when I was on call from Friday morning till Monday night. So I had the x-ray table with a pillow and a, shirt and a blanket, <laughs> which worked quite well. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're t so tired, you have to have something until finally another woman came in as an intern and then we got a room. Women were, women's Medical College was the only medical school in the, in the country at the time anyway, so that's where we were. I got married during that time and, and uh, had my first son and then my husband and I, he was a physician too, we went to Wellsville, Ohio for our practice and still, the whole concept of diseases being our enemy and we're working against it was what I was taught and what I was working with. But something kept getting to me. There, that wasn't quite right. I'd watch my parents deal with the very, very sick people in India, with lepers, with people who had nothing in the villages. But how my parents worked with the patients in the villages with almost no technology, very little to do, but they had healing going on, and I knew there was something more that, that was part of the whole healing process. But you know, I, I, I didn't have a name for it, but when my eldest son, who is a retired orthopedic surgeon now, <clears throat> came through Phoenix, he stopped and he said, Ma, he was going down to Del Rio to start his practice. He said, Mom, I'm real scared. He said, you know, I'm going into the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. <laughs> but if you can understand that it's your job to be what you've been taught to do to the very best of your ability, and then support the patient as they do their own healing. You have nothing to be afraid of. And I realized that what I was talking about was the physician within each patient. That as a physician, if I could contact the physician within each patient, we'd have a relationship and things would go better. And it, it helped me all the way through. And so we moved to Phoenix in 1955, started the ARE clinic, Worked with, got acupuncture started, and did a number of a lot of other things. But in 1978, we started the American Holistic Medical Association. The reason for starting that was we, we un, the, well, those of us who started it realized that we had to bring the spirit back into, the spirit of healing back into medicine. But took us, two years to figure out how to spell holistic <laughs> with a W or an H, and it wasn't until we realized that we were talking about health and healing and holy as a root word for holistic. So that's when it became that. And then sometime in the line in about 1996, I was in the grocery, Safeway grocery store down the street here pushing my cart, and I heard over the PA system, the hardware store down the street, announcing itself as a holistic hardware store. <laughs> and I stopped my cart, and I said, well, there you have it. You know? <laughs> they don't know what it means, but it's become a household word. So we had to come up with another word to, to do what we were doing. And I'd been talking about for some time about the concept of living medicine because what I'd been taught was all about killing. And so I had found out that 
what I really needed to do was do, do what the Native Americans talk about, which is that life itself is medicine. So the medicine we needed to talk about and work with was whole process of living medicine. And then through the years, I've become aware of the way that, that medicine works, as it's been working, and it's been manifesting itself. You know, to manifest something, you have to, it's sort of like Jacob's Ladder. You, you get to one length, and then you get to another, and then you get to another. And this is a masculine, masculine aspect of manifesting things, and it's, it needs to be, we need that. But I have a friend who said to me not too long ago, you know, I think we have another word, and that's femifest. And I've taken on to that because I like that word. If manifesting is climbing Jacob's ladder, femifesting is climbing a spiral. And if you femifest, you can be on the level five and know what's going on in level two. The feminine knows these things. The masculine doesn't. We have been looking away from each other and fighting each other and trying to figure out why things are. But what we really need is to work together, like the right hand and the left hand. So femifestation, I think, is a really good word. And that's part of living medicine. And you know what? We don't have five races on this world. We have one human race. And as one human race, we need to really know how to work together. All aspects of ourselves. And so I've come up with five L's that I call the five L's as the foundation for living medicine. The first one is life. Without life, nothing else counts. But on the other hand, life by itself is like a seed that's sitting there with all the energy within it. But what it needs is a spark of love, which is a divine spark to activate it. So love is the second L. It activates life. The third L is laughter. Laughter without love is cruel, it's mean. But laughter with love is joyful and it's happiness. The fourth one is labor. Labor without love is drudgery. It's hard. But labor with love is bliss. It's why a singer sings. It's why I do the medicine. It's why it's, it's, it's what makes our hearts sing. And the fifth L is listening. Listening without love is empty sound, but listening with love is understanding. So the concept of living medicine, I'm using the, the, this as the foundation for the con concept of living medicine. And somebody said to me a while back, so, okay, what about gratitude? What about hope and the fruits of the Spirit? And I said, well, those are the building blocks with which we build on the foundation of living medicine. So our whole f focus on healing from the feminine point of view is, is mixed with the masculine. We, we have to work together, and as we do that, and look for life as living process, we may find out that all kinds of things happen. So here we are, all of a sudden, 2020 comes along and bam, we're in the middle of another epidemic. And right in the middle of the worst one that has ever been around. And it's an energy we can't see, we can't hear, we can't, e we can't even shoot or bomb it, you know? <laughs> There's no way, we can't even find a pharmaceutical that will kill it. We're really stuck. But you know what we can do? We can reclaim our family units and our homes.
And while we wait to manifest the vaccine, we can manifest the simple things which we know how to do to save lives. These simple things, I have a, a daughter-in-law who's, who's a pediatrician in Flagstaff, and what she tells her patients is do the three W's. The three W's are wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distances. You know, when these simple things are presented to us, they're, we're so used to having you know, hard things to do. These simple things sound like they're not going to work, or they're not doable, or they're silly, or whatever. But when you do these simple things, people don't get sick. Isn't that amazing? So with the three W's, I think, are along with the five L's, are things that we really can work with in the, in, in the process of the whole healing. But then I got to thinking about it. You know, the whole world is involved with this virus. I mean, it's everywhere. There, there isn't any, any country that isn't facing it. What we have done to Mother Earth has been to kill, in the process of, of trying to find all the things that we're looking for, we've almost killed her. We've worked, we've bled the oil out of her and made her anemic. We've used the minerals that she has and made osteoporotic. We have then d done to our soil so much damage that we can't even plant f food that nourishes ourselves. So there's something that we need to do to, to, to stop killing Mother Earth. We've been doing that and doing that. And then I got to think, you know, when a surgeon, when a surgeon goes into the surgery, the first thing he does, is, or she does, is put on a mask. The second thing they do is wash their hands. The third thing that they do is find their place. And their place is a space, their own space. Now, Mother Earth has given us this amazing arena, surgical arena or life place. It's, it's, it's our Earth. And there it is. And if we think that we can just go running around and destroying her, that's, that doesn't help anybody and, and certainly doesn't help us. But if we can take back the simple things which I have learned, my parents worked within the jungles of India, that, and I may not know how to, well, I do know how to read and write now, but it's, it's you know, it's who. <laughs> we may not know all these things, but we know these simple things. And they're so simple that we don't really understand how important they are because they're the very, very essence of what healing is all about. We have all the medical things, we have all the instruments and all of that which are really important but those instruments don't do anything unless we have the touch and the ability to work with people so bringing this whole concept of healing i think that's what this virus has done for us it's because we have to do that we don't have any other way of doing it sure the the uh, the vaccine will manifest someplace along the line. But in the meantime, we'll do these simple things that she understands and that we understand because she knows how to manifest and work with manifest and all that stuff. So let's win this war against this virus by learning how to live with Mother Earth. 
And when I was a child, there were, I knew a hymn. I'm not going to sing it. You wouldn't be happy. <laughs> that I think says what we need to do. And it goes, lead on, O King Eternal. The day of march has come. For not with swords of loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, thy heavenly kingdom comes. Thank you.